Still time. Time flies. Indeed. David, welcome back. Thank you. Always good to be here. Thanks for getting up, brother. I'm an early riser, thank you. Um, for everyone who uh, watches this on YouTube, um, David Orr is, you, you are unique in the country. You are much lauded for the work you do running elections for all of Cook County outside of the city of Chicago proper. Um, as someone who actually did some training under you, I know that the folks who work in your office to train judges to prepare for election day are a quality bunch doing a really great job. And I thank you for your service all these years. I'm not sure if people really uh, can understand what, what you've uh, managed to pull off there, um, but it's really quite astounding. I wish the city of Chicago had such a uh, overseer on our elections as you. Well, thanks, Katie. Are we getting any closer to the city having that kind of service and attention? <clears throat> I think we're getting closer. I, I do believe the when you raise issues, even though uh, my responsibility is in the county, uh, it has a great spill-off effect. Uh, over the years, they've uh, adopted many of the things that we've done. In fact, they have taken people from my office to work in theirs. Uh, so I do think there's been a lot of improvements in the City Board of Elections. The controversial thing going on right now, and then we'll get to the main subject, is that every think tank in the last 20 years has suggested that we should combine the two jurisdictions. The county clerk's uh, election department does the suburbs and the city board of elections. Mayor Daly's panel a few years ago pushed it really hard. A new panel for Rahm Emanuel has pushed it. Uh, the bottom line is politics is still preventing that. So all the uh, experts say it should be done. There could be many, many millions of savings, uh, 10 million a year at a time when we're cutting mental health clinics, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but let's put it like this. There has been lots of talk, not much action. I think politics will prevent that from happening in the near future, which is very sad. Politics meaning some people have a vested interest in keeping the system as it is? Um, the people with the power are not willing to go far enough to do it. And even though at this time when, you know, budget is everything, what you just said, that it would save money, that it would uh, put money back in the city's coffers, does not overcome whatever is seen as the political gain for these individuals? Absolutely, yeah. But the good because news... Because it means jobs, or...? Well, sure. I mean, uh, still pretty much everything in, in government in Cook County, even though patronage has weakened and we have more laws and more people have gone to jail, remember the vast majority of those people are still there from the way in which they got hired. And uh, many of the major politicians in this county, city, and state keep track of every one of those people. And they know exactly where the jobs are. and They, they have that much time on their hands? This is important to them. It's very important to them. But one, one good thing that's come of this is now the powers that be in the city and the county have had to look carefully at the two election budgets, mine and the city's. Uh, now, the bad news is they've discovered an enormous difference in how much we each get. Right. Now, the county has more elections, much more complicated elections, more registered voters, usually. The city has... It's it's close though, right? It's very close. But the city has, like some years with no elections, like next year, much easier elections. There's just 50 wards. Right. In the county, there's hundreds and hundreds. There's over a thousand taxing bodies. There's hundreds of towns. But the bottom line is one jurisdiction gets somewhere above $10 million more a year than the other. And you can guess which. Uh, so that is being looked at. Uh, I would say the... Uh, there's been a lot of pronouncements on the joint city-county collaboration. We're making strides. We're nowhere near where we should be. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you impressed Michael quite a bit with your presentation Monday night at the uh, 49th Ward political meeting about, I'm, I'm assuming it was all about voter protection and... Um, Just answering a question. But, um, yeah, he answered a question, but it, it, it tweaked my uh, desire to know more about the voter suppression movement that's going on in the country. I mean, we've heard first about Florida, we've heard about Texas, uh, we're concerned uh, about both of those states, but also Pennsylvania, uh, and there are a number of other states. And uh, so I think the question that comes up for some people 
is uh, why not uh, voter ID laws? Uh, some people say people have already registered to vote, why would they have to carry around an ID? And, uh, and then there's the question of uh, even if there was a voter ID uh, law in effect in a state, uh, how that's used to manipulate uh, the vote and basically suppress the vote. So give us a little bit of your uh, insight into this overall issue that's very crucial at this time. If you don't mind, make sure I come back to the specific question. But let me just give a quick context. I mean, it's, it's, it's important. It, it's corny, but we know this stuff. For thousands of years, the way people s settle decisions like this was through violence. So the tribe that would win, the country that would win, we, we kill the other folks, we take over and we rule. That's power. Now, in an alleged democracy, and ours is, is barely worthy of the name anymore, it's a greatly weakened democracy, but in a situation like ours, that power is every bit as important. The power to declare war, the power to tax, is every bit as important as when Genghis Khan was conquering everybody. So, it's so naive of many of us to assume the way to accumulate that power. The naive don't realize that government has enormous power, and so they give up a lot of it by not participating. The insiders know Elections will determine enormous power and make the millionaires billionaires, etc. So we got to remember that. And they know that elections are often decided by that small number of people who are kind of in the middle of the road and maybe switch from Democrat Republic. So uh, that, that there's always been this, and I, I'm going to beat up the Republicans today for the voter suppression efforts they've done, but those of us in Chicago, and, and we, we three and others in the audience know, the Democrats were great at voter suppression. Uh, there it wasn't so much repressing Republicans, it was repressing those Democrats that weren't on their side. And they did that in some of the ways that the Republicans do today, in other ways flat out violence. I mean, the way they beat up our people years ago and, and found ways to deregister them. Uh, but now it's most Republicans. So the, the key to what Michael said is that they are very clever. The Bush White House, after the 2000 election was stolen, and, no, and I, I say these, I'm, I'm not trying to be outrageous, we blamed it all on the Chads in Florida. That wasn't it. It was the Supreme Court stepped in, in an extraordinarily unusual case, uh, and basically gave the election to, to Bush. The Bush White House began immediately, because they know they didn't win the election, they know they didn't have enough votes. Uh, they began working, and all through the, the last 12 years, there's been enormous activities. But one of the biggest things they got away with, if you remember, is the Bush White House fired about eight or nine um, uh, um, U.S. attorneys right. in Republican states because they would not prosecute voter fraud to the extent that the White House did. Yeah, in Arizona, and I remember. There Arizona, was a, lot, a lot of places. Republican. Now, they got away with it. Uh, when the Democrats took control, they were, as usual, mamby-pammies and did nothing. Uh, <laughs> but I, I say that because these people are mamby pambies I know some of them, and they're very clever. What clever means is, if you just ask about voter IDs, most Americans would probably say, well, of course, why not? Okay, so get to the heart of it is two things. We have to decide if the photo IDs, the way it's being implemented in some of these states, is really to fight fraud, as they say, or really to decline certain major democratic populations like blacks and Latinos and young. So let's look at some facts. Uh, first of all, uh, every group that's looked at this says there's almost absolutely no truth to the widespread fraud they're talking about, particularly when it comes to voter impersonation. That's what the photo ID is supposed to say. Now, in most places, you have to prove who you are when you register. And in most places, you go to the Secretary of State's office, you're there in person, you got your ID. So that's the way we register. In most cases, though, we don't require it at the polling place uh, for the following reasons. Uh, so that's the history, but they understand um, people, well, why shouldn't they have? So first of all, there's absolutely no evidence that fraud is the way it should be. Okay, and every study shows that. I think it was, might have been the Brennan sister, but somebody Brennan Center came out recently and said you're six times more likely to be struck by lightning than get convicted of voter impersonation. Okay? Now, not that we should be concerned about fraud. Again, what I started with, that we know what people can do. We should be concerned. But the voter ID is to stop voter impersonation. Just one good example because of time. So we take Texas. Texas passes the law. Okay? Now, in Texas's report and brief, they could find not one single case in these 10 years they reviewed of voter impersonation. But they did admit in their brief that roughly 700,000 Latinos did not have the requisite voter ID that the law just passed. 
So uh, there are decent people that think this is okay. I'm talking about the motives, and there's probably decent people that don't understand these motives. Let's go a little further to prove the point. So in Texas, the reformer types, you know, su suggest several amendments. Because down the road, voter ID, if we had it, photo ID at the polling place, a few years from now, when everybody could get a free one, when it was guaranteed access, we, we dealt with all the problems, like in Pennsylvania, 11% of the entire population doesn't have one. Okay, that's a lot of votes. Okay, 11% of those registered to vote don't have it. So back to Texas. So what the reformers said, okay, so we, we can't win this, let's amend it. So let's say, first of all, that if you're really poor and you can't afford this, and this is like a poll tax, that the state will pay for it. They voted that down. And they voted down several amendments, including one that there's 81 counties in the state of Texas that do not have a Secretary of State's office. And somebody said, wait a second, if you're going to make people go to get that and not able to vote, let's at least put a Secretary of State's office where they can do it. The answer to that was no. So if you look carefully at all these things, it's an absolute uh, refusal to do anything which, which legitimize a photo ID. Let's take something uh, dear to uh, Michael's, uh, uh, the great work that he does up in Northwestern, who's coming up in a moment. So That would be Michael Peskin. Michael Peskin, Professor Peskin from Northwestern. So um, everybody says we need to get young people involved, right? Students, it's great for them, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so in Texas, uh, part of their photo ID is that if you're a student in Texas with a government-issued student ID, that's not good enough. So the state of Texas gives you an ID, you can't use that for voting. Jeez. So just to make it simple, um, most of these are very clearly planned to hit at certain populations. Uh, the ideal is swing states. Now unfortunately some Democrats have uh, been on the bandwagon because they don't think it through. Uh, they don't understand some of these things. Uh, all of the um, ob objective groups would agree with this. Uh, even worse, other parts of voter suppression, as you might know, in Florida, which is probably the worst of all in many ways, Florida went ahead and passed an extremely dangerous voter registration law. Because remember, after the Bush White House and others destroyed ACORN, which is a very legitimate group that was registering poor people throughout the country, right. they go after voter registration. And they made it so um, difficult that the League of Women Voters actually had to say, we quit in Texas. Because what they were saying is, you register these people, you've got to bring the cards in within 48 hours. Now, that's like saying to someone, a League of Women Voters person who lives in Elgin, and every time they register somebody, they got to bring it all the way downtown. Now, does that make any sense? But that was the law, and furthermore, you'd be seriously fined, so they could have been wiped out. Now, for the little bit of good news, I'm sorry if I'm going too long, but the good news is the Obama White House finally got moving. The Justice Department uh, knocked out Texas and South Carolina, although it's still in court. Wisconsin struck down, uh, the court struck down Wisconsin. Florida's had several wins and losses in their battle, and in this case, the registration one was knocked out. So. Uh, so, voter, wait. Which means the legal voters can go back and register people. In Florida. Right. And did you say they struck down the Texas? Well, here, here in, in the South, we, because of the civil rights laws, thank God for them, uh, we have to have something called preclearance. Right. Because the history of discriminating in their voting says that when, when the southern states, most of them, pass laws affecting voting, it has to be cleared by the Justice Department. And the Republicans have been enormously fighting hard to take that away in the last 20 years. Fortunately, they haven't been successful. So uh, the Justice Department, under Eric Holder, struck down South Carolina and Texas as a couple of them. Now, but they have a right to go to court. So that, that is in court as we speak. Uh, so they're smart though, they're going after uh, particularly the photo ID because if uh, there's a study out, I think it's, I mean, his name is Slater, but there's a lot of things one could look up um, on the web where it proves that these measures will help the Republicans. Um, like I say, Pennsylvania 11%, but when you look at the 11% of, of people that don't have them, the vast majority of those people are black, brown, and very elderly. Uh, and so you, you do that in every state, and you find that. So besides the photo ID, besides trying to stop students, um, and besides trying to make registration more difficult, um, they've also tried to kill same-day registration. But a good thing happened, I believe, in Maine. Um, they actually passed it. The voters were so angry, they demanded a referendum and they put it back. 
Remember, same-day registration is something I support. It means that even if you didn't register, that you can still go vote on election day. And register at the register same at the moment. Same time. Let me ask you a question about Texas, where you uh, pointed out that uh, a great number of people who are uh, basically disenfranchised through voter suppression uh, can't even find a place to register in their county. I would assume most of these people don't have driver's licenses, so they don't, how would they get to, you know, it's just an added burden to get to the next county. Right, so, so the key to this, like I say, is uh, we can should talk about what we do about it, but the key is if there's a certain kind of a very restrict photo ID. Now if you say you can have photo ID but you can use all these other things, that's a little more lenient. There's supposed to be a law if you, and the law is supposed to say this by courts, if in fact you do require that, the states are supposed to pay for it but they found ways not to do it. Uh, so um, what you need is a photo ID that, that you get from the driver's facility or a state ID like we have in Illinois, that you're not a driver but you get a state ID. Right. Well, yes, in many cases you need other identification, you need a birth record. So again, the reformers in Texas said, why don't we give the poor a free birth, birth record so they could go in Secretary of State's office and get a photo ID and right. they turned that down too. So you, you did talk about pushback from like Holder uh, and others. How much, how extensive is the pushback? Do you think it will be effective? Do you think this, uh, this uh, wave of voter suppression in uh, swing states and Republican controlled states uh, is uh, continuing, will have a big impact? Or do you think we'll be able to nip it in the bud enough to this election so it's not uh, a, a draconian situation? Well, first, first the good news and then I think the challenge to it is, like we say, at this point Wisconsin's was struck down. Texas and South Carolina are in the pits at the moment. Uh, there's been some success in Michigan. Pennsylvania is, is up to challenge. Uh, some of the red states, uh, I don't think they're challenged as much, but it won't matter. They're going to win that state anyway. So things are up in the air, which is good. But what people need to do, uh, and particularly in the swing states, is to find ways first to identify those. A lot of people don't realize it. Uh, again, there's, I, I figure that there are more seniors in Pennsylvania without the proper ID than the city of Pittsburgh. Wow. Say it again. There are more seniors in the state of Pennsylvania without the proper ID than the city of Pittsburgh. We've got to get Carl okay. Davidson on that. So th the key is those people need to be identified. They need to understand it. Some of them will go on their own to get the proper ID if, if in fact, we don't win these court bills. Other times there may be people that have to help provide financial assistance or rides to people so they get the correct ID. Um, it has the potential to be devastating. On the other hand, uh, we're aware of it now. Legally, we're winning a number of these cases. Um, so I, I do believe uh, we can minimize the impact in the short run. Uh, what should activists be doing right now about this? Well, they should be supporting all these efforts legally and politically, making a lot of noise, and making it hard for those people that pass the legislation or even support it. Uh, they may not have been successful here in Illinois, but many people support it, and they should be taken to task. But above all, where there's organizing going on, to again identify those people. Uh, by the way, you know, you voted in the past, but you don't have the ID. It's a new requirement, and try and help those people to re-register in time. Um, I know that we're running out of time, and um, there's way too much I would like to ask you. Um, well, how about we'll have David come back and talk more about voter suppression? <laughs> yeah, I think we should uh, regularly. I mean, in I between think it's now. I think it's a continuing issue. <laughs> it is a continuing issue. I was surprised when I got your uh, democracy news this week that you were focused on TIF money. And I um, didn't realize that that was in your bailiwick. And, um, the nice thing about this job, most people don't know, I mean, why did I want to... Everything's be, in your bailiwick. Why did I want to be county clerk, you know, 20 years ago? Well, elections was number one. But there's a lot of other things that we deal with, which means I can stick my mouth out there on other things, which I'm trying to do more and more. But uh, since... We since welcome we, that, Since David. we set the tax rates in the 1,500 taxing bodies in Cook County, we have a fiduciary responsibility to put out our TIFs. And as TIFs, we don't have time to go into it, but that it's a... Tax it's, increment financing. It's a very clever tool that is being used wisely in some places and not so wisely in Chicago. Over six billion dollars has come out of property tax people's uh, hands, which they don't even realize. Uh, even worse in Chicago, it's been a piggy bank uh, for Mayor Daley to do what he wanted with, most of it to help downtown business over the last several years. But so we do a report uh, once a year 
Um, and what we try and do is not just all these complicated numbers, but we try and point out uh, what the effect of all this is. And if you want to go online, let me just do real quick advertising. If you go on cookcountyclerk.com, our website, you can get information about the TIFs, see if you live in a TIF, where your money is going, etc. Uh, you can also get all sorts of information about elections uh, and what your ballot may look like and if you're registered and so forth. We need to be getting that word out to people. Check. If you live in the city of Chicago, you can go to chicagoelections.com. If you live in suburban Cook, you can go to uh, Cook County, um, what did I say? Cookcountyclerk.com. Uh, so the, the significant thing about the latest TIF money is the dramatic decline because of the recession. So Chicago has pulled in more than 100 million less in the last four years than they used to. Uh, what I'm going to hopefully predict right here. Uh, given the horrendous situation of the way of, in which our teachers being treated in the city of Chicago, there is a way that we can resolve this mess, and that is by using TIF surplus money to reach a reasonable settlement so the teachers, if they have to work extra hours and so forth, actually can benefit. The city says they have no money. The Board of Education says they have no money. There's a, at least a billion and a half sitting there in all these TIFs. Now again, some of them have plans. Our TIF up here in Rogers Park did a good job. The one up here, you know, the new uh, area up there where I go exercise and go to Dominic's, that's dramatic improvement from the past. But now we're giving $30 million to the new River Point Plaza. Um, so we give a lot of money to the very, very rich. So just keep that in mind. Uh, look it on the website, but uh, I'm trying to push that with my friends of the unions. I've let the mayor's people know this, whether they like it or not. Uh, people will deny it, but there's a lot of money there that's not really accounted for. And in this crisis, if we could tap some of that for the next four or five years, I think we could settle the teacher's potential strike. David Orr, uh, thanks a lot for coming on the show this morning. Uh, how would people contact you if they wanted to get your democracy newsletter? Um, for one, if you have a card or scribble it down, we, we don't, uh, not like my buddy Joe, you won't get something every day. But you'll get something um, maybe twice a month. All it is is that the latest one talks about TIFs. Uh, uh, there's another one that talks about changes in legislation, which affects early voting. Uh, but you shouldn't be scared. It's actually a good thing. Um, but stuff like that, change in the laws, or it's, that's not very partisan. But let me say something else. Um, I'm trying to step up my political website, which has been dormant. I've got a son helping me. Uh, if you want to look on davidor.org, um, you might find it interesting. You might have some ideas. We put some of the stuff up there that's a little more political. Uh, and we're trying to find all these wonderful old videos. I found a video the day after Harold Washington died where we had that big press conference. So that video is on the website now. And there's all sorts of other th p things that we have on there. We've got old pictures. We've got a lot of a lot of stuff. We got a lot of times of you on this show that we could give you to put up. But so I'm trying to build that. Uh, of course, the idea would be to build in more regular policy stuff. So if you got the time, give it a look and uh, let us know. Is what there you an think. announcement in here somewhere? What that I'm retiring? No. 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 There's no, no announcement. I just um, <laughs> stay in just there, checking. Okay, let's have a big round of applause for David Orr. You are listening to the Live from the Heartland show. You may be watching it on youtube.com slash heartlandmedia where you can find all of the, many of the earlier editions of the show. And we've got a rare treat here. We've got um, a Liz Mandeville coming up and she is a, a blues singer living in Chicago. She's out of Wisconsin. She's been to Mississippi, et cetera, et cetera. She got a new album out called Clarksdale. How about coming on up here, Liz? I know you're, you're finishing off that breakfast, but... Uh, we're looking forward to having you. Pardon? Oh. Oh, well, uh, hold on. We're going to take cut <laughs> that all out. Let's start again. <laughs> all right. I want to thank you all for tuning in and listening to the Live from the Heartland show here on WLUW 88.7, Chicago Sound Alliance. Uh, you can also get it on www.wluw.org. And you can hear it anywhere in the world at uh, you. well, that W. Excuse me, at WLUW.org. And you can right get it on YouTube.com slash Heartland Media.